the wrong guy, which is why that didn't make sense. All right. So we have one of our all-stars um, pre speaking now, <laughs> uh, Phil Lubin. And Phil Lubin is the poster child for uh, NASA 360 videos out of the NIAC Symposium. So you can ask him what that means you know, at, at your leisure, but he's probably going to touch on it himself. So. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so in case you're wondering if I had anything to do with the timing of the announcement, I did, did not, although I, <laughs> I was, I actually, well, whatever. I uh, initially did not have anything in my talk about it, but then it's watching the clock and kind of new. So all right, here it is. Um, so we now have what looks like pretty decent evidence for a, a planet around the, uh, pardon? It's an artistic image, yes. <laughs> not real, sorry. Okay, uh, some, someday, someday. Anyway, uh, it was just announced at uh, uh, 1 o'clock ET, and it's part of the uh, Hill Red Dot collaboration. Uh, it's done with uh, radio velocity measurements. It looks pretty, uh, pretty good. Anyway, okay, so just, that just occurred, and uh, I've never quite had the timing of that for a talk, but had some other timing the last year, and a lot has changed since I was uh, at the phase one level. Okay, next. Yeah, let's see. Is there a uh, laser pointer? The flat one? Or the one that says, do not look? Okay. Uh, right, thanks. Okay, so uh, we're in a phase two. Uh, this program is called the uh, Directed Energy Interference Stellar Studies Program. So if you want to get to high speeds to go to the nearest stars, you've got to get to relativistic speeds uh, if you want to get there within a reasonable time. And the only way to do that, that we know is get to relativistic exhaust speeds. There's only a couple of possibilities, antimatter, matter annihilation engines, uh, fusion, which actually isn't all that efficient. Um, you only convert about 1% of the mass, if you're lucky, into um, energy. Uh, or don't take any propulsion system with you at all, which is what we've opted for. So uh, the, the don't leave home without it is actually don't leave home with it. Okay, uh, we put on our website um, uh, design your own mission photon uh, calculator. You can decide where you're going and how fast, uh, how long it takes to get there, um, and you design your own mission. You might check it out. There's a almost 70 page paper on the archives called The Roadmap to Interstellar Flight. It's almost all mathematics. I don't, haven't met a single person who has actually read the paper um, because they keep asking me things. And I say it's on section 10.3, page 62. Uh, anyway, if you can't sleep at night, you might check it out. Uh, there's a, a great NASA 360 video that I had uh, very, very little to do with putting together, but NASA had everything to do with putting together. Uh, I'm just the person speaking in the background, but they did a great job on that. Uh, so in the last year, a lot of things happened. We got a, a phase one in April, uh, well, it was announced, I guess I got the call in April 2015. Um, and then, uh, there's a long story behind that, which I won't have time for. Uh, about a year later, um, well, actually about six months after this, I ran into Pete Warden at the 100 YSS conference in Santa Clara. Um, told him what I was doing. He said, send me the paper. So I sent him this paper in a preliminary form, because we were about halfway through the NIAC. And he handed it to a friend who happened to be uh, have some money, um, Uri Milner, who uh, then in April announced $100 million to support the R&D phase, but only for a ground-based effort, so it's completely different in that sense than our NASA effort, which is uh, targeted towards space-based arrays, um, and we have a very strong emphasis on adaptive optics, so it's very, very complementary. It's very different, um, but it does have synergy, clearly, with the NASA program. Uh, then we got a phase two announced, uh, I guess May 12th, um, which is this one, and then there's a curious uh, blip in the NASA FY17 appropriations bill, which may or may not make it um, into the actual final one, uh, but Culberson calls for NASA to look at a greater than 10% speed of light mission uh, to coincide with the 100th anniversary of the moon landing. So that's all happened in the last approximately a little more than 12 months. Okay, this is a good quote in case you ever uh, think that you know what the future is going to be like. You might want to remember this uh, quote, which was slightly off the mark. Okay, so I want to show you a quick video because that really 
tells you everything. I don't really have to say much more. This was... Why do people explore? You know, that's a really profoundly interesting question. We've looked at the sky for as long as we've been alive, and we've dreamed in stories and in movies of traveling to the stars. Why? We want to see what's out there. The problem is that while we can go to the moon and while we actually have within our power to go to Mars, we don't have a well-defined way to get out to the stars. So what we're proposing is precisely that, a well- I don't know if that's me or not, but I didn't do anything. Okay, uh, okay if we, it's okay if we can't play it, don't worry. All right, we'll just go on. Okay, uh, if you want to look at it, it's on our website, along with the NASA 360 video, which is a great video. All right, so in order to get to the stars, you really need to go fast. Uh, if, if you're content with Voyager, you're going to have to wait 100,000 years, so we need a little bit of, of, uh, of suspension to get there. Uh, that makes it difficult. On the way out, there's a lot of things to look at, so it's not just uh, Alpha Centauri or the nearest stars or nothing. There's all kinds of interesting things, but you've got to go fast to get there and that's not within our normal propulsion technology. So this is how fast humans have gotten things to go. Uh, this is speed in meters per second over here. This is beta divided by the speed of light. Um, and this is gamma minus one, which is, uh, gives you some information about the kinetic energy. In the laboratory, we get within one meter per second the speed of light. Uh, this is chemical propulsion down here, and you can see that we have a long ways to go on this logarithmic plot. Probably need a new battery in this thing pretty soon. Uh, there's a technological divide in here, which is what we are looking at in terms of using directed energy to actually get us there. Okay, within 25 light years of the Earth, there's a lot of targets. We know there are exoplanets out there, and we know that there are a number of targets, so it's not just Alpha Centauri at all. We've got many targets. Uh, you know, there's lots of things which are discovered every day, even today, uh, was one announced. Um, Kepler, of course, shows us that there's about one planet per star, approximately. So that's an amazing number, very different than we thought before. Uh, I, I had nothing to do with this, except, of course, did have something to do with it, but on the other side, uh, Culberson from Texas, who's the chair of the Appropriations Committee, wrote into his version of it uh, that NASA should look at the uh, possibility of making a trip to Alpha Centauri to coincide with 100 years since the moon landing, and then specifically mentions uh, the NIAC program and our work uh, uh, directly in that. So probably won't ever have that chance to influence a NASA appropriations bill. Uh, there's no money, of course, in it, okay, so don't get too excited. Okay, uh, we've been busy forming collaborations, so uh, just coincidentally, one of the things that happened earlier this year was the federal government funded a thing called the uh, American Institute of Manufacturing for Photonics, which is a national photonics effort, which there are a number of institutions, of which NASA is one of them, uh, involved, which is to look at uh, applications of photonics for a variety of purposes, of which Interstellar is not one. But they've become very interested in what we're doing. So we have some interested people out there who find this fascinating in addition to the many uh, uh, beautiful letters I get from school children who say I want to help. Literally, I've had children say, I want to hold a PTA fundraising event for you guys. I've literally had those emails, and those are just the most beautiful emails uh, I've ever seen. Anyway, this, the head of this, the West Coast head, happens to be UC Santa Barbara. The East Coast head is actually in New York, which is the PI. Okay, so what doesn't work? Well, unfortunately, everything you're used to doesn't work. Chemical propellants, ion engines, solar sails, nuclear thermal, even nuclear fusion is going to be a stretch. This one does work really, really well. In fact, it works perfectly, um, but has some issues. Okay, a couple numbers to keep in mind. Uh, the shuttle, when it used to go up, or the SLS, when it will go up, or the Falcon 9, or Proton, et cetera. The power at liftoff is about uh, of order 50 to 100 gigawatts. That's how much chemical power is being produced for a few minutes. Kinetic energy in orbit of something like the shuttle is a kiloton, so it's a small tactical nuclear weapon. Um, the things we're talking about are very small, although we can launch any mass, but uh, heavier is slower, or more massive is slower. Uh, also has a kiloton, approximately. So they make good frisbees, interstellar frisbees. Just be careful where you shoot them. Um, but if they hit our atmosphere, we actually got this question, if they hit our atmosphere, what do we see? 
you just see a, a, a upper atmosphere disturbance, which is another name that is used in the parlance of looking for things that might be coming in. So it's very simple. You just leave your flashlight at home, take your laser pointer like this one, shine it at your sail, which this is not a good representation, uh, and then out you go. And this only takes a few minutes to accelerate up to about 20 to 30 percent the speed of light for a small spacecraft, very small, and then you're gone. And then what do you do? Nothing? No, you shoot the next one out. So you could shoot a spacecraft out every five minutes if you wanted. So this is a totally different paradigm shift in technology, which I think should be understood. Why is it enabled now? Why can you do it now? Um, frankly, it's because consumers want ultra-fast data. They want to watch YouTube you know, and other things. They want the data now. So people spend a lot of time working on sending data down fibers, and amplifiers are needed. And now those amplifiers are capable of doing what we want to do. So we're uh, being driven to the stars by gamers, a lot like the other parts of electronic industries. Anyway, these things are extremely efficient. They're currently 42% uh, wall plug efficiency. And they're soon be about a kilogram per kilowatt. So you can, in your hand, currently, you can hold one, which is a kilowatt, uh, which is going to lead to an interesting world. They are also on an exponential growth phase. So I took data out of the literature and from my colleagues in various communities, including DOD, and just plot them up, and this is what you get. And this is power out of a single mode fiber. Uh, for the next speaker, we probably should replace this. Versus year. Uh, doubling time is about 20 months. Remarkably similar to the electronics doubling time. This is the cost of the particular amplifiers we're using in 2016 dollars, exponentially decreasing with time decreased time, half time of 18 months. Um, the way you do this is, is using a, a fiber phased array. And this is the only way I know how to realistically do this program currently. But you know, there may be other ways. You, you take a lot of fiber amplifiers and parallel them. So it's a single seed laser. Oops. Single seed laser. There's really only one laser here, which is very tiny. It's this one over here a few watts, and then you amplify up to a border 100 watts to kilowatt per amplifier and parallel them out in a large array um, and form a phased array. Um, okay, a lot of technical problems with that, so I could spend hours on that one. The same thing if you're used in reverse. So when you're not transmitting, you flip it around and you receive, you take out the laser amplifiers and you just use fiber going back. Uh, fiber is particularly low loss, and you suddenly have yourself a kilometer scale telescope, which is another um, technology enabled by this program, which is kilometer scale telescopes for all kinds of things, including laser comm and astronomical uses. Uh, anyway, this is what it looks like. There's a poster over there if you want to see it in detail. There's an amplifier and fiber on each optical element. Each optical element is very small. It's about the size of your hand. And then you uh, parallel them into subarrays and then make bigger arrays. This is one that we're building in Santa Barbara. Thank you to NASA NIAC. Um, we're starting to uh, build one. This is all student built. Um, this is a 19 element uh, single mode fiber array. Um, most of it's bought by, on eBay, by the way, in case you're wondering. So we try to use our, our NASA dollars very efficiently, as well as other dollars. Uh, by the way, we have no money currently from uh, the Breakthrough Foundation, in case anyone's wondering. We have zero dollars. Uh, but hopefully that will change at some point. Um, let's see, so there's uh, an equation that relates the speed to the power um, in the laser. You can't see this, sorry. And d, little d, which is the diameter of the array, and lambda, of course, the wavelength. m naught is the mass of the spacecraft. Uh, interestingly, the speed goes inversely to the minus one quarter power of the spacecraft, which means if you increase the spacecraft mass by factor 10,000, the speed only goes down by factor 10. Uh, I can explain why later. Uh, anyway, these are some drawings the students are making up. It's almost all student-driven. Uh, and this is what a 100 by 100 array or 10,000 element array looks like. OK, uh, here is speed as a function of array size for different uh, aperture fluxes, 100, 10, and 1 kilowatt per square meter. I'm so sorry. Um, the dashed lines here are 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3. I should just use my hands, uh, except I can't reach that high. Um, uh, up to one times the speed of light. Okay, speed of light, 10%, uh, 1%, 0.1%. .1%. So you can get up to close to the speed of light with small objects. Um, 
or you can get lower speeds for exploring the solar system with heavier objects. Uh, a lot of details, not going to worry about. We want to build a laboratory test facility to get up to about 30 kilometers per second. It's one of the things that's on our agenda to look at. Um, this is what it looks like. It's basically a big uh, tube. Oh, thank you. Okay, appreciate that. Um, oh, much, much better. This is a real directed energy device. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> finally. Um, actually, last time I was in a DARPA facility, I asked if I could use a laser pointer. Um, this facility happens to build laser amplifiers, the type we're using. They said, no, I could not. It's too dangerous. Um, literally, that's what they told me. I said, you got to be kidding. They said, nope. Okay, fine. Okay, so this is a, about a milliwatt. Uh, so this is a, one of the laser arrays that we would want to put into a vacuum tube and accelerate up objects. So this could be done in a laboratory, a large laboratory, admittedly. Um, but we think we can get up to hundreds of kilometers per second with this technique, which brings up some interesting applications which we don't have time to talk about. We can also use this for beam combining tests. One of the things we'd like to do is beam combine over a kilometer. The LIGO tubes, for reference, are four kilometers long, so there's precedence for doing it. In this one, we don't even need a high vacuum. In this one, you do. Um, so you take two arrays, put them at each end, and then you beam combine and look at all the systematics and things you want. This is a pretty high fidelity test you can do in a laboratory setting. Uh, you can get up well above 30 kilometers. OK, sorry about that. Uh, path forward, yeah, it's not more of the same, OK? Uh, you just cannot get there uh, economically. You need integration, highly, highly integrated systems, OK? And I'll finish quickly. This is some work we're doing in Santa Barbara on photonics on a chip. And this is a 3.5 on silicon that John Bauer's group is doing in the engineering department. This is a way to get ultra-high density um, interconnects and semiconductor amplifiers on a wafer. This is a path forward to lowering the cost dramatically. Uh, this is a chip which uh, graduate student Eric Stanton in uh, EC that works with John uh, put together and submitted in May, <coughs> at no cost to NASA. Um, this is uh, a coherent receiver, so this is the receive side for the laser comp. Uh, this is an example of ultra-low uh, mass electronics. This is, uh, you can make a submicron thick semiconductor wafers by this technique and have a full set of electronics on board. This is some work done at IBM in Yorktown in 2013. So there's some very clever techniques going forward here that we plan to, to look at. Amortization, you build one system here and you can do all kinds of things from subgram to kilogram to going to Mars, you can have a human capable craft, not the same day like the, the media tells you. Uh, Amazon could do one day delivery to Mars, not recommended. Uh, takes a human craft about 30 days with the system to get to Mars uh, for the, the one that we proposed in the NIAC. But you also get all these other things for free. You get full uh, planetary defense. Uh, you can do asteroid capture. Uh, you can do composition analysis, and Gary will talk about this tomorrow. You can beam power. You can even do some interesting terraforming things. Um, and you can make kilometer telescopes. Economics, I don't have time to talk about. OK, so last slide. All right, if you want to get there, uh, this is a path to get to the stars. I don't know how to do it. Otherwise, I'd love to get your ideas. It's also a path to get to rapid solar system access, potentially. So there's a roadmap here. It's evolutionary, and we can start it now. And the consequences are truly transformative. So this is something which I'm very grateful that NIAC has funded. Uh, and uh, some of the future does require new inventions, but fundamentally nothing particularly new. We just need a higher level of integration, primarily for economics reasons. And of course, there are a lot of technical problems. So I'll stop there. Uh, the video? If you want to show it, it's OK. You can skip ahead a little bit. Why do people explore? You know, that's a really profoundly interesting question. We've looked at the sky for as long as we've been alive. And we've dreamed in stories and in movies of traveling to the stars. Why? We want to see what's out there. The problem is that while we can go to the moon and while we actually have within our power to go to Mars, we don't have a well-defined way to get out the stars. So what we're proposing is precisely that, a well-defined and logical way to go to the stars, not with humans, but with robotic probes. So I'm, I'm a professor in the physics department at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, this department is one of the 
top 10 departments in the country in physics. We have a group in our department, the Experimental Cosmology Group, that we started in 1987. And it's a very dynamic group. Some of those students are also focused on applications of directed energy systems. The main mission behind the Experimental Cosmology Group is to advance science and advance directed energy studies and its application. There's an aircraft flying overhead that you hear. That aircraft can only fly about the speed of sound, but that's way too slow to explore the stars. If you were to maintain that same speed and wanted to go to the nearest star, it would take you more than five million years in that aircraft. In our system, with the smallest probes, it could take as little as 20 years. If we want to get to Alpha Centauri in 20 years, we have to take our ideas and scale them down. And in order to do that, we've set up a vacuum chamber to simulate space conditions. The Trick Energy System is basically like a laser pointer. You take a laser or a flashlight, you turn it on, you direct energy. That beam can be used for many purposes. When it's taken to extremes, it can be used to deflect an asteroid coming into the Earth. It can be used to propel a spacecraft. In order to get to the future, we need to take small steps. I like to think baby steps, right? Some of those include just laboratory measurements of the thrust that you can get from ablating an asteroid, the thrust you get from propelling a spacecraft. If you scale that up to large-scale directed energy systems like we're proposing, that force becomes significant. Theoretically, the wafer spacecraft is actually four inches by four inches, almost as thin as your hair. And these probes would literally be a spacecraft on a chip. The propulsion system is the laser which stays at the or on the moon or nearby. You fire it and then it's gone. If we reduce the, the spacecraft to a, a wafer, which would have things like imaging sensors, cameras for looking at the stars for orientation, and then a laser communication system to communicate back uh, to the Earth. But keep in mind the same system, this is a very important point, the same system is used not just to send out one probe, but to send out a, an armada of probes. It takes about 10 minutes to accelerate up a wafer to 30% the speed of light, and that's it. You could send 100 per day or more. You could send nearly 40,000 per year. Once we have thousands of spacecrafts out in space, we can look at many things out in space that we've never been able to explore before, such as the solar gravity lens, uh, Alpha Centauri, the, the closest star. When we really begin to look at the issues of sending humanity into, into interstellar travel, it becomes very different than the movies. We're not really the ideal creatures to be traveling. Really what we want is not necessarily to, to spread our bodies throughout the universe, but to spread the capability of replicating ourselves, or our, our spirit, our inquiry, our biological subsystems. Obviously you're going to start out with critics and people that are going to question you. But then, as we can, we can actually see people like starting to like our idea more and more and like coming to it. And I think that's really special and that's where the optimism comes from. That movie was filmed in November, about halfway through the NIAC program. That young man is 17 years old. Um, and uh, almost all the people working on this program are extremely young, except for recently we have some uh, older folks like myself. Um, OK, so I'll take questions if anyone wants. Or if we're out of time, we're out of time. OK, sure. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about a couple of problems, John Kramer and uh, NEC. Uh, first. Uh, if you take a flat object and shine a laser beam on it, there tends to be an instability, and that if it tilts slightly sideways, you're going to force it, tilts it further. So how do you stabilize the sail? Um, so the sail's not flat. Yeah, yeah. That, that's just an artistic representation. So the, the sail actually has a curvature to it to maintain a passive stability. So it's sort of cup-shaped or something. Huh? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, in yeah, some yeah. sense, it looks like a re-entry vehicle. All that does is switch, is shift the instability to something. Yeah, there's a variety of instabilities. Um, yeah. So you can actually beamform the system so that you have a, a non-Gaussian shape. So you can actually have a toroidal shape, so you have a hole in the middle. So you can actually, uh, in theory, you can get a beam following out of your space. It has to be point. dynamic and change when it gets unstable or what? Uh, well, the problem is the feedback time in the servo loop because the, the spacecraft is so far away, it goes out several lunar distances in the small case. No, I mean the, the object itself, not the beam. Uh. Uh, well, the, the mirror, does, does the reflecting surface have to shift it, around it, in order to stay stable? No. In, in, no, it, it doesn't look like it has to. It can locally on board the spacecraft yeah, sense I, the beam. 
but we cannot uh, control it from the earth because the feedback time is too long. Okay. But I mean, it's an excellent question. It's one of hundreds of problems that we have to deal with. Yeah, the, the other question I wanted to ask you about is that you need to be, have very, very, very high re reflectivity because uh, you can't eat any of the energy that's coming in. And all the reflectors I know about are very wavelength specific. Yeah. And the thing is getting Doppler shifted as it goes faster and faster, so the wavelength isn't holding still for you. So what do you do about that? That's correct. Okay, so the, the, the wavelength shifts by the fraction of the speed of light. So with 30% of the speed of light, the wavelength is shifted by 30%. Um, so the coatings that we've designed are actually broadband enough to, to deal with that. But uh, let me give the following example. The, the fluxes on target are in the order of 10 to to 100 gigawatts per square meter, which sounds like a lot of flux. However, if you take a single mode fiber, which is used every day in fiber optics communications and being used today in this transmission, uh, the flux out of the end of a single mode fiber with a single watt into that fiber, which is nothing uh, compared to what it can take, is uh, 10 gigawatts per mm -hmm. square meter. So we already know how to make materials that can easily withstand vastly more than this um, power. However, uh, you are absolutely right that you must design the reflector so it does not have much absorptivity. The reflectivity is actually not the critical part. It's the absorptivity, which for metal is linked, but for a dielectric it's not. So we're focusing on dielectric reflectors. Um, you can get 5.9s reflectors, and they're 99.99% reflective today, which are good enough, and we have designs in our paper that show that. Um, and for LIGO, they were 6.9s. So they were 10 to minus 6, which is good enough for us. But the problem is the LIGO coating technique is, is too thick for us. So w yet another problem to solve. But it doesn't look insurmountable. That's actually one of my lesser worries. Okay. I have lots of worries. <laughs> so you don't need barium fluoride sintered dust? Um, don't need what? <laughs> oh, oh, no. Yeah, uh, because, of course, um, you can optimize for the specific wavelength that's being shot at the Well, as, as I was just pointing out, as this craft moves away, you shift the resonance point if you do right. a resonant technique. Our, our coatings are resonant, but they're broadband resonance. Right. Um, now, there's a lot of questions. Um, of course, you know, we're, we're talking about as decades, so we can be patient. Correct. Uh, but we want all these questions answered by the next NIAC uh, meeting. The... the uh, since John already asked about the stability, and we all know there are some very big problems there. Mm -hmm. um, also, comparison with microwaves. Yeah. I mean, some of the, some, you know, some of, the, some of my pals who are, you know. I Benf know some of them. Yes, the Benford boys and all of that. Yes, thank they, you. They, they, want, they, they think that microwaves have advantages, and this is your chance to answer that. Yeah, so... Um, I won't name names, but when I speak to people, I say, let's do the math. And sometimes people walk away from me at that point. Um, so I, I got tired of telling people to do the math, so I did the math for them, gave them a calculator. Go to our website, run the photon calculator, put whatever wavelength you want in, put a microwave system in, crank the power up, change the array size, you'll get the velocity out. Okay, if you want an array to go at the same speed as the array that we're talking about, but do it at one millimeter wavelength, which is 300 gigahertz, which is extraordinarily ambitious for any millimeter wave system. But let's just say magically we could do that. Well, you're being ambitious with your lasers. I'm being ambitious, right. But Okay, so let's say you want to do that. You know how large the array is? It's the size of the Earth. Well, uh, it's, just, it's just physics. I can't change that. Well, all right. You're trying to bundle a whole bunch of, uh, never mind. Oh, he's just math. I uh, just math. Uh, all right. Well, in any event, uh, come and see me if you want to talk. Very. With me. I'm planning to. Thank it's, you. Good. Very, I'm looking very, forward to it. Very, very, very okay. good talk.